Do you have a hoarding problem? If you're a crafter, you do. It's d d just admit it, you have a hoarding problem. You're always gonna see these things that you can use for something. You don't know what, but you can always use it for something. And you're gonna make some excuses. This would look really good as a shirt. You see, that's my excuse for most fabrics. And then it sits on my shelf for a few years until I figured out I have so many of those this would be a nice shirt fabrics that I'm gonna make a video about. I'm gonna make my own assembly line and I'm thinking that it's gonna go a whole lot faster than if I were to make one shirt at a time. So what I plan to do is to go through my fabrics, pick out the ones that I want to make into shirts or maybe like button down dresses which is basically just a long, it's a long shirt, that's it, it it's a long shirt. And maybe we can do something interesting with them and spice a few of them up and maybe learn something along the way. I'm not staying hopeful, well I am, I am staying hopeful, maybe we'll learn something, but um, mostly I think I'm gonna get rid of this fabric and actually feel really good about myself doing something. So this is my fabric sash. I have this shelf, which is mainly my cotton quilting fabrics and all of them are in the category of this would make a nice shirt. Okay, so this is a nice pile. Okay, so this is my pile of fabrics. You probably can't see anything. I'm gonna switch you around. But I don't know exactly how much I have of each fabric. So first of all, I'm going to sort it in some better lighting. Okay, so here we have it. Uh, this is a nice thin, I think it's a viscosis or a viscosis blend. And it's absolutely beautiful. And I want to keep it to use as linings because I love having fun and pretty linings. This one I've already made a shirt out of. It's a, I think it's a cotton, but it is very thick. It is a very sturdy fabric and I do not want to make another shirt out of it. This is, oh, this is definitely a polyester, isn't it? And it's full of, Macarons. Mm, yes, it's adorable. It's not my style though. <laughs> I could make a shirt out of this that I will probably never ever wear or I can save it and use it as a lining. That's that's gonna be my new thing, isn't it? Oh, that would be perfect as a lining. Yes, let's put it in the lining pile instead. This one, I love it. It's full of these old magazine ads and it's a very fun fabric and it is very thick again it's either a curtain or an upholstery fabric don't want to make a shirt out of this this one is cute and full of holes how much do i have of this that is one by one meter that's a t-shirt if anything but this this is going to go in the let's make it pile for now. Screw you. You're bad. This is a... Is this the same linen? Yes, it's the same. Different batch. But I would want to make something like a pirate shirt out of this, honestly. This is going to be a shirt, but not today. Not for this. It's going to be a different type of shirt. This is another linen. How much do I have of this? How do you too much? Not at all. Is this a shirt? Or is it a skirt? I don't like making a shirt out of this. I don't I don't want to. I want to make a skirt. Uh, I bought this from a shop that was shutting down. This is a lining fabric and I it would look nice as a shirt. Let's put it in the shirt pot. This is a scrap. I bought this to make a t-shirt thingy I made a t-shirt thingy and it was too small I made it too small for myself and I have at least a meter so it's gonna go in the pile and then we have another one this is one and a half meter that's perfect you're going in this is going in this is absolutely beautiful and I bought it for a dress 
a uh, button down shirt dress that is so it's going in the pile this one I've already made a dress out of how much do I have of you oh that's not even a meter no you're not gonna be a you're not gonna be anything you're a scrap this one was bought specifically to make a shirt. I have one and a half meter in this, I'm pretty sure that's usually the amount I buy. This is apparently four meters by 45. This is cotton, but it's again, it's a nasty cotton. It, ah, it's full, of, it's been treated in a way that makes it just feel bad. It has this fast fashion feel when you go around and you touch garments in a fast fashion shop you're gonna get this. It feels like you get not a coating but it feels like all the moisture on your fingers are just sucked out. Not today I think. This is beautiful and very 30s. It's a uh, what's it called? Crap? It's a crap fabric. Give up. Surrender at least one by one. This is gonna be a 30s blouse, maybe. And then this one, uh, this is something I got from my grandma, so she probably has a shirt like this already. This is more like one and a half times one. This looks more 30s than 40s to me, but maybe it's more of a transition into 40s. I would prefer it to be pre-60s, <laughs> but I'm gonna admit it looks very 70s. My grandma probably bought these in the uh, early 80s or something, which is 40 years ago, which, which is a long time, isn't it? Then, some honorable mentions. This is the cheapest fabric I own, and I love it and I hate it. This is a viscosis fabric, I've used quite a lot of it, but I still have a lot left, and I want to make so many things with this, but it is impossible to cut it. It is so flimsy. It looks nice. I used this one for my coat, one of the coats I made as well, and that was a mistake, because I just combined the three most flimsy fabrics I owned. I would like to make so many things with this, that's why I bought so much, which was unnecessary, but it was cheap, so I feel good about it still. And then I have this curtain fabric from my grandma again. It is very thick, so I don't want to make a shirt out of it, I would die, but I want to make a skirt. A 50s, 40s housewife skirt, maybe 50s, I like 50s more for skirts. And then I have this fabric full of cats. I have one... I don't think I have too much of this left. Maybe there's only room for this one last shirt. And these two fabric no, they don't match. Don't, don't, don't do it. So I changed my mind. This is going to be made into shirts the similar way, just by using squares, the old timey and zero waste way. And it, I don't think that's going to be part of this video. I think I'm going to do it another time, which means it's going to go back on the shelf and stay there for a few more years. Okay, I think it's finally time to start on the actual sewing. This will be my base pattern for the shirts. I decided to try and make a timeline where each garment is inspired by a decade, so I dig out the sleeve pattern for my Edwardian blouse as we start in the 1900s. I added extra fabric for the button stand, but I'm also adding a whole bunch of extra width to these pieces, which I forgot why immediately, and this will be taken in again later. I didn't have enough fabric to make a high collar, so I opted for just a collar stand. Then for the next one. I had almost 2 meters of this fabric, so after checking the length, 
I decided to make a simple A-line dress inspired by the late 1910s. There wasn't much fabric left, so the sleeves were cut short. I didn't have any fabric left for the collar, so I went looking through my stash and found this matching linen. Here I'm trying to make a sailor collar, and I also decided to lengthen the cuffs of the sleeves. and then the 30s. Now, at this point in time, a technique where you gather fabric into darts were extremely popular. I decided to freehand this pattern, which was not a good idea. As the fabric was so busy, I wanted to make the color out of a solid color. And here you have the 30s in one picture. All we're lacking is the depression. Oh wait, we're already here. If it looks like I don't know what I'm doing, it's because I don't really know what I'm doing. I cut out a big round colour of both the fashion fabric and the contrasting one, that way I could choose later. The crepe fabric will be an homage to the 40s. It will be very similar to the previous one, but with long sleeves. I wanted to shape the bodice similar to the 30s one, but change the gathering of the darts to see how it shapes the bodice differently. I still don't know what I'm doing, I'm just trying something and hoping it works out. Similarly to the other one, I'm closing the shoulder dart and leaving a gap in the centre back, as I want to make the darts in the neck as was common at the time.
Then I found this scrap that matched the white of the crepe and I'll be using this for cuffs and collar. I think this type of collar is called a shawl collar and I've learned that this semi-stretch fabric that don't iron is a very very bad choice with this type of collar. in a pineapple under the sea, this is the 50s. This should be a simple one, but I decided to complicate things. First, the simple part. I add an extra 15 cm to the shoulder to make the sleeves. Just remember to tilt the line down with about 5 cm or so. Cutting out a simple one piece colour. Then moving right along to the 60s. I'm going to use the same pattern to replicate the sleeves, but this one will button up in the sides, so I need to make a larger neck hole. Here I'm cutting out the facing for the boat neck. Seventies it is. Now, admittedly, this isn't a typical seventies fabric, but I'll try to at least imitate the shirts at a time. This is a narrow quilting fabric and I didn't have enough space for a full sleeve so I split it in half. Then I forgot that I can fold fabric and cut out a whole lot of pieces for the cuffs. I kept this simple colour because I was tired of making new things. But I regret not making a bigger one to match the period. This fabric just screams 80s and I'm here for it. I'm going to copy the exact pattern as the previous one. This last fabric I bought to make a button-down dress, which fitted with the aesthetic I was all about in the 2010s. This one gets a proper standing colour. The skirt will be a simple square one.
finally, with all the pieces cut out, I'm starting by marking and sewing all the dots of the chest and upper back. For these funny ones, I'm adding a bit of iron-on interfacing so that the fabric don't disintegrate on me. Then I'm cutting open the dot. Gathering up one side by hand before stitching it close on my machine. Now, I have a sway back, which is why I'm putting darts into the back of all of these. And as we move on, you'll see that I make things that fit me, but not my mannequin. Now for the dress. I didn't want to go the modern route and instead used a Victorian pattern as a guide for where to put the double dots. I fold and stitch the simple button stands in the front pieces.
Now, because this shirt was so simple, I wanted to make bound buttonholes, which isn't that difficult, but you need to do it properly and preferably make them big. So here I am, marking some small squares on a strip of fabric and stitching each square individually. You can see I have double squares. This is because I thought I could cheat and bind both sides, but I didn't make the gap between them big enough. The strip is cut into squares and turned in. Now let me show you how you're supposed to do it, sort of. I pick out my buttons and draw my buttonholes on a strip of fabric. Then I stitch each individual hole with tiny stitches. The fabric is cut into squares, buttonholes are opened and turned in. And after ironing it looks like this. Perfect. Okay, so I placed them on the back side of the button stand, so I'm making a new back. I'm marking each button and adding interfacing so it'll stay happy. At this point I realised that the front pieces weren't the same size because of my mistake, so I needed to remove the extra width. I did this by creating a fold, which I also hid the raw edges of the button stand in. The shoulder seams are finished with French seams. And for the Victorian one, I forgot about the extra width that I needed to remove in the back and closed it straight down. No, yes.
the modern dress will be stitched up using the overlock stitch on my machine. Time for colour. I stitch it up and iron in the seam allowances, then I sandwich the neck hole and top stitch it down. The ones I couldn't use the sandwich method for, I stitched down the back of the collar and finished the rest by hand. After trying it on, I didn't like the look of the plain canvas, so I used the fashion fabric side instead. The raw edges of the button stand was folded over twice and stitched down as well. Then it's time for some decoration, well so I thought. I either didn't have enough or not the right colour on the trims, so the colours are staying plain. I closed the neck facing for the 60s top and sew it to the neck hole. Now, because I felt fancy, I decided to make this little V in the front. It was ironed and then top stitched down.
Back in time to the 50s, I finish up the colour. In the 70s, I've decided to become a crazy cat lady and I've spent way too long trying to draw paws on the collar. The 80s passes by without any excitement, here I should have made a pointed colour to keep to the decade. The only tip I have for this colour is don't sew across the seam, just fasten your thread on both sides, it makes it easy to remove bulk later. I didn't account for overlock seams and thus made the seam allowances too big. Instead of redoing anything, I spent all that time making more darts. Okay, so I can never find my chalk, and I always end up stepping on it. Yes, I know. It's time for sleeves. I start by closing them all with French seams. The Victorian one is simply hemmed. For the 1910s I'm making these long cuffs.
sleeve is gathered down and the whole sandwich is stitched by hand. For the 30s and the 40s I'm making cuffs and once again gathering the sleeve down, fitting and stitching. For the 50s, I'm measuring down 20cm, which is my sleeve, and folding it in twice. For the 60s, I'm finishing all the raw edges this way. For the 70s, I start by assembling the sleeves with French seams, but I leave a 10cm gap for the cuff closure. This part is then folded in twice and top stitched down. I made me square little cuffs and decided to fit them so that this little sticky outy thing would be hidden when closed. Then I repeated it for the 80s shirt but making the cuffs fit this time. I also decided to fold the excess fabric instead of gathering. The bodies of the dress was finished with an overlock stitch. I hemmed all the shirts and the skirts. The skirt was attached to the bodice. Then time had come to make some more darts.
I don't really know how I messed up with this, but my hope is that it's just gonna fix itself along the way. So the things I make usually falls into two categories very loose and not fitted at all and way too big or a bit too tight and this one fits into the Ooh. this is a nice one and a bit small maybe I don't know we'll see I haven't washed this fabric either so with these I am trying okay look at me so with these I am trying to actually make a few variations on them and making different types of darts but there are so many things you can do with a shirt meant for the same person and I do actually intend to wear these and I have already reached a point with some of them where it looks too costumey for me and I don't have a wardrobe that it fits into. Anyway, I was gonna do the fold and stitch with this one, you'll see. At least I think you'll see it. I don't know how to describe most of these, so I hope the footage speaks for itself. This is a look, right? It's not. I'm gonna... I'm gonna take it out again. The top part that is. For this one I made half darts. Okay, so this worked for the front, but I don't think it worked at all for the back. Um, I should really just redo them, but I don't really know what to do with them. And I don't really want to, because honestly with these types of sh 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 shirts, tops, um, whatever it's called, you're gonna do this. So really, does it matter? Maybe I should just, like, remove the darts all together in the back. I have a few more to do, so. I decided to simply chuck the bottom part, that way they look okay. I think I'm just gonna make darts because this is my poor attempt at 70s. And uh, there is absolutely nothing 70s about this entire thing. So at least what I can do is to make it kind of sleek. Tall and sleek, that is the 70s. Almost done now. For the Victorian one, I draped the sleeves until they looked okay, secured them with the stitch, and then inserted them into the armhole. The raw edges were finished with pinking shirts. So I realised after pulling out the gathering thread that I put the sleeves in the wrong way, which obviously I did. It's not like I've done this before. The cuffs confused me. As you might have noticed if you made it this far, I have a lot of shit stuff, stuff, in my windowsill. And it's gonna come in handy now. So first of all, this is my very messy desk. Starting off. This is some boning and some measurements and oh, you're not supposed to be here. This is an old, uh, I don't know, sewing needle case. It's pretty, I don't know how old it is. Then there's a manual for my sewing machine. I have a whetstone because I never remember where I put it, so I put it somewhere 
where I would see it often. Um, some safety pins. This is a box that surprisingly contains buttons. It says patent buttons made in Norway. I don't know how old they are. Here's another tin. Surprise, surprise, it contains buttons. Um, and it says excellent mending kit on it. This is just my hand sewing supply. This is a really adorable box and it used to contain hairpins. It says uh, pretty hairpins, hair needles uh, and I think it's German. This thing looks old, it's modern, it's a tin of baking soda and I'm using it to store some snap buttons. This is a cigar case, you'll never guess what's inside of it. Once again, these are old, but I don't know how old. This little box here contains hooks and eyes. I don't really know what it says on the tin, but I doubt it's the same as what the content is. This was found with the hooks and eyes in it, I don't know how old they are. This thing is a racist pincushion. I don't know how common these are in the rest of the world, but you can find these absolutely everywhere in Norway. But it does have some nice old-timey pins in it. This one is a box from a pharmacy where I'm from. It doesn't say what it used to contain. They, uh, someone's scratched away what it used to be. Surprise! It contains buttons. Another box. You'll never guess. Oh. Buttons everywhere. Jewelry supplies that I don't know how I've gotten and I'm never gonna use. These tea boxes also contain buttons, as do this jar. And with that done, let's finish this off. My sewing machine doesn't sew buttonholes, so I have to do all of these by hand. After choosing the buttons, I start off by marking, cutting open and stitching a simple buttonhole stitch. For the dresses, I also add snap buttons. To finish off a proper bound buttonhole, I clip open the back, fold it under and whip stitch down. Then, for this next one, you need to grab your most expensive book, a box of snap buttons and hate. The sides of this 60s top full close with buttons. For the 70s shirt, I searched all across the country for these types of buttons and I was certain I bought enough, but couldn't find the other set, so I'm supplementing with some green snap buttons instead.
Since the cuffs were now the wrong way and bigger than needed, I trimmed and stitched them down to match the sleeve. Since my paws didn't look like paws, I decided to add some decor. And with that, the last one is finished. The Victorian one had a bit of a weird fit to begin with, but it turned out looking perfectly old-fashioned. Here it is, worn over an 1880s corset. And this is how I will most likely wear it. The best part about this one is how the colour looks. I'm already looking forward to doing it again. It looks perfect for its time, and I'd like to name this look McGonagall Goes to the Beach. And this is how I will most likely wear it. This blouse fits awfully on my mannequin, but this is what it looks like on me. And even if my skirt is too short, as soon as you wear it with your shirt over it, it looks perfectly 30s. The best part about this one is the fit. The sleeves were a bit long and the collar won't behave, but I like the look. This one fits into more than one decade, depending on how you style it. Perfectly vintage. Apparently you're not supposed to wear a chemise under these skirts. This one is just fun. In need of some fray check? What fun! I've already gotten some wear out of it.
This was so easy to make and I've already worn it a lot. Perfect for warm summers and the buttons on the side makes it super easy to maintain. Now admittedly, without the hair and makeup, this look isn't exactly 60s. So here's a bonus. My grandma made this for herself when she was 20. And now I look like a kindergarten teacher. Apart from the crazy fabric, this is a plain and simple shirt. I like it. Time to let loose the hair. With these velvet 70s pants, it completes the look. Now let's not forget about the other end of the 70s. This was wool. Authentic 70s warm, warm wool. This is loose and perfectly retro, but no self-respecting person in the 80s would wear their shirt untouched. I look like my mom now. Also, the summer version. For how much work that went into it, it still looks loose fitting, but it's also really comfy. Do you guys remember the part of the 2010s where the aesthetic circled around Wednesday Adams? And that's all. Thank you for making it to the end. Please tell me how your day is going. Until next time. What am I gonna do? Oh, that's a really nice note. Oh, why hello there. I didn't see you come in. Today, I wanted to show you, um, I'm not gonna bother.